Shana Sen, director and producer of All That Breeds. This is such a gorgeous documentary about two brothers who run a bird clinic in Delhi and rehabilitate uh, primarily black kites, this uh, bird of prey, and uh, and they've been heavily impacted by the pollution in the city. And I know you discovered them uh, during a Google search. Uh, so at what point did you think this would be a great documentary? Well, actually the film was never intended to be what um, you described in your log line, funnily enough, like it was never, <laughs> be, you know, especially a sweet film about nice people doing good things. So it was never meant to be a film about a bird clinic. Uh, uh, when you live in the city of Delhi, the air itself is such a uh, opaque, grey, heavy, tactile, uh, you know, like a big presence that um, you're often uh, thinking about it. You're often, it has such a creepy sentience that you're often cogitating about the air itself. And I was interested also philosophically in human animal relationships. And in a way, I wanted to do something on this abstract triangulation of air, humans, birds. And it was more about a tone or a sensorium of life in the city. And I, the idea was to try and do something on the kinship or simultaneity between human on human life. So, so essentially, very vaguely, that's the sort of glow at the back of my head when it started. And essentially, this one day when I was um, uh, in my car driving, I had the distinct impression of seeing this black dot in the sky fall to the ground, which is a, a black kite, a bird, fall to the ground. And I just happened to Google um, where do birds that fall off go. And I realized that there were... Uh, many of these every day and just uh, on a lark I decided to visit the brothers Nadim and Saud who on their in their tiny grubby derelict basement um, have been treating black kites for the last 15 years and I realized they've been treating like they've treated 25,000 black kites in the last 15 years and and not just the fact that that's staggering that's actually the not the most interesting part they're also philosophers of the urban and I wanted to do a kind of cinematic poetic lyrical piece on coexistence and kinship or entanglement between human and non-human life in the city mm -hmm. uh, well this is just your second documentary and I don't believe you produced your first one cities of sleep so what went into getting this one off the ground and and getting the funding and like getting other producers on board well I learned the hard way you know it's like uh um, in the first one, when you realize that you need to have more control and you figure out things, you know, you figure out things about um, um, uh, that raising resources is a slow accretion and it's actually better that way. You figure out things like, um, um, you know, what is good money and what is bad money. And most importantly, like I think my one learning that we fully used in this film is that kind of concatenation between um, grants, equity. And so, you know, it's a, a mixture of models help. And in our case, what we did, if is, if, is it okay if I go into the weeds of it? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the first year, when we were largely in development, we were predicated mainly on um, develop on, on grants. And, you know, we got grants from Sundance and Tribeca and IDFA and Catapult and so on. And uh, that really helps because it, there's not a huge time pressure on you, right? Um, after that, we went, you know, like you become a pitching machine across various pitching forums and then you meet various possible partners and so on. And we were uh, fortunate enough to uh, first strike our a very long-lasting partnership that's still ongoing with uh, Rise Films and Teddy Leifer became a producer. And then finally, we had uh, um, a studio called Tangle Bank Studio, which came on board and which became the primary financiers. So it was a slow kind of a um, accretion. And I think that kind of a thing worked better because different rhythms of the film's production, I think, also require different collaborators. And in that sense, I think it like worked well. Mm -hmm, for sure. So uh, when did you guys start filming? Because I know it, it took a couple of years, right? Three years, actually. We started uh, at the very beginning, actually, on the 1st January of 2019. Wow. Okay. So you guys also filmed like through COVID too? 
Uh, yes, or, and you mean, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> or, yeah. Or you, or you stopped, I'm assuming, a little, and then... Yeah, well, a lot. We, it was a hugely start-stop thing. Mm -hmm. and uh, But, you know, it's a documentary, so it sort of waxes and wanes according to the rhythms of the uh, characters' lives, which also came to kind of uh, standstill at that point. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, well, it, I, I think like that, you know, this, the, the format of it, just the cinema verite aspect of it, and you just, you're just following the brothers and you're not sure, you know, what's going to happen next. Uh, it also ties into, you know, one of the themes of the film, like uh, nature and how we all adapt and we have to adapt based on what's happening. And so I get, can you just talk about just filming them through those couple of years and then just um, seeing the material you were getting and like are you like cutting in your head like what kind of direction you want to go in because I think um you've talked about at a certain point like these brothers like they're not they're kind of their personalities they're so quiet but I I love them and then, like they have these great voiceovers and they're so laconic uh <laughs> in, in how they describe things okay. but uh it works so well so I guess yeah when when you don't have a call sheet like a narrative feature uh how how do you plot what you're filming or what what do you go into a day-to-day -day expecting when you're filming well I haven't done narrative since film school so I mean this is all I've been doing for 10 years so I wouldn't know what to do with a call sheet actually uh, <laughs> the, um, the thing here is that um, see you when you jump off the cliff you understand that it's going to be a fever dream where most of this kind of verity documentary is a kind of embrace of the radical unscriptedness of life itself right so mm -hmm. you're open for that kind of a thing the thing to note about this particular film is that we decided that the conventional verite observational form will not be the kind of front and center form for this because what we did was that we also have this whole panoply of um, shots of animals right these slow languid pans these really languorous slow tilts and tracks and all of that and uh, the thing is that we realized that uh, the outer container or the outer shape aesthetically of the film has to be that of a fiction film. So it looks like a fiction film, right? We use tracks and cranes and dollies and all of that. But of course, we're not telling characters how to behave because that never works. But essentially during the shooting, what happened is that because there are three threads in the film, there's the relationship of these two brothers who treat the kites and their relationship then their family's relationship with the kites itself and you know the inner life of mind of their family uh, there's the political of all the volatile stuff that's happening on the streets right outside because Delhi was going through such a tumultuous and turbulent time in those two years and thirdly there's the ecological which is the broader kind of rubric which is wrapping the whole thing in the first year after six or eight months of shooting I realized that so for the first eight months I was shooting handheld and uh, you know handheld sometimes feels a bit restless and anxious and I and because the characters are so contemplative and meditative I, it was clear to me that eventually that I had to move to a more fluid style of shooting so we actually junked like we trashed about um, eight months of shooting and started afresh again with this new kind of a more cinematic uh, style um, and after that, you know, it's like a fever dream. It's like a free fall. You know, it's like uh, things keep happening. And really the uh, hard decision is when to stop, not how to shoot or when or what to shoot. It's always when to stop. When do you think you have enough of for a um, 90 minute? So when did you decide this is we have, we have to stop now? And when we all reached a critical mass of exhaustion and the <laughs> producers reached a critical mass of impatience. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, uh, jokes about the, um, I mean, we always had a kind of, I had some of the beats in my head. That's what you always do, right? You have vague kind of beats in your head. And you know that once the nerve center of this one thing has been hit, you know that you have a vague kind of a parabola or a trajectory of uh, things. And um, uh, so I had a vague sense of that. And I was often shooting and editing simultaneously. We cut the film in Denmark in Copenhagen actually and um, so there and we had booked the time of the editor there and Denmark is not a cheap cheap place so uh, that sort of put a uh, automatic deadline on things mm -hmm. yeah um, I want to go back to the, the the visual language of the film because I love the juxtaposition of you know it, it again it goes back to like the interconnectedness of like humans and nature and animals but like the brothers they're working in this tiny cramped room 
and then the next shot you just see these birds the, the kites and the open grand skies right, right, right. Uh, so when did you lock in on on that contrast well you know i think um we were vaguely uh aware of it during shooting but we really drilled down on it i think in the edit when um let me put this way the structuring logic of the film of the edit actually is we keep cutting we keep vacillating between extreme one extremely claustrophobic cramped stifling place which is a basement in which the brothers work which immediately cuts to the open wide expansive skies of the city so the you know the uh, open so we keep going between extreme claustrophobia to extreme so it's a little like it's a little like inhaling and exhaling it's a little like breathing actually and once you figure that out that sort of gives a kind of a, a, a temporal and a, a tone rhythm to the film so that became a kind of structural because you can lean into both fully right when you're in the tiny place you can really lean into the claustrophobia of it all and when you're open and shooting the vistas of Delhi skies, then you can really lean into that. So that sort of helps, you know, any kind of a boundary condition helps in structuring a film. And um, uh, that sort of a thing really helped. Other than that, we just like, I was certain that I did not want to, I was more sure of what we did not want to do. We did not want to make a nature or a wildlife talk. We did not want to make a regular socio-political, in the sense that a conventionally front and center politics sort of a film. Um, and uh, because it is there, but it's there obliquely. And uh, thirdly, we mostly did not want to make a sweet film about an NGO of saving birds. So it had to be cinematic, it had to be dark, and it had to be um, um, nuanced and sophisticated. So that was the plan, and the form had to follow that uh, instinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. There's there's not a lot of like preachiness or like even like doom and gloom about it at all. But it's all there. Um, uh, well, lastly, it's been a year since, <clears throat> excuse me, the film premiered at Sundance. You, it's been so successful. Congratulations on the Oscar nomination. Um, how are the brothers now? Where are they now? How how's things going with them? Well, the, I mean, both, all of them are back in Delhi. Nadim went back to Delhi soon after. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they were really thrilled. I mean, they you know they came. All three of them came to Cannes. Um, at this point, Nadim has gone to almost as many festivals as I have, <laughs> gone to a ton of festivals, um, uh, to the point that I think now he's a bit surprised when there are screenings without him, no matter where in the world. Like, why didn't they uh, call me? Like... <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, he came for uh, the film forum opening in New York. He came now to again, uh, again to New York for Cinema Eye and so on. So, and he's going to come for the BAFTAs now, and they'll be there for the Oscars. So um, they're thrilled about the travel. They're thrilled about the fact that there's a huge spotlight on their work and on um, the ecological thing that they've devoted their, that their lives to. But, you know, it's not easy. I don't want to simplistic. And of course, I mean, I should say that materially our producers have um, uh, given um, our uh, funders, our financiers have pro provided a year's funding to the bird hospital. So there has been a concrete help. But having said that, I don't want to simplistically kind of like make it sound like, uh, look, uh, there are like three Don Quixotes who, like every bird that flies off those uh, that basement is a miracle, right? And their life is not easy. It's financially and emotionally very demanding. And it's not like a film will change everything in one fell swoop. So hopefully what the film provides is some alleviation or a year's worth of an oasis to their lives and some kind of betterment. But I'm not um, simple-mindedly naive about just how much a film can change a whole family's life entirely. Mm -hmm, sure. Uh, well, Shanak, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time. And we'll see you back here in a little bit. Thank you. See you in a Thank bit. Thank you so much.